afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, good afternoon. How are you, sir? Fine, how are you? I am very good by the grace of God, thank you. Good. Rubab, you're okay? Yes, sir, I'm fine. Well, I guess we're gonna start with two. Oh, no, three. Okay, we'll start with three. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bring more people to class today, but um, I pray that you'll also help people with their finances, Lord. And I pray, Father, for the student who told me that there just isn't money right now, and I pray that you'll help us to be able to help him. I pray that you would work in this class, Lord. Um, I pray that we would understand the book of Numbers and also that we'd be prepared for the, the, um, the quizzes that are coming up in the near future. And I ask God that you will please help us, Lord, to apply your word properly in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that you would please help me not to say anything I shouldn't say and help everybody, Lord God, to be able to get a grasp of this um, amazing book. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, I was a part of a miracle on Wednesday. I put together what's going to happen to you as far as quizzing goes. And it was very cruel what I did, but also what I did was good. So what I'm going to do is take you over to here. To here. All right. This is on your Moodle uh, for this course. And you understand that when it's online, that I can't ask the kinds of questions that professors ask that just memorization questions, which are really not super good questions anyway. But I can't do that because you just have everything right in front of you. There's no learning. So what I'm doing here, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to help you so that you can at least know what's in the Torah. And so the way I'm gonna do that, um, two ways. One is I'm gonna ask you theological questions, biblical questions, um, essays. And here are the three essay questions that I'm gonna ask. And they're just right here, pretty straightforward. And your source of answers is only my notes, uh, my lectures and discussions. In other words, I don't want you finding answers from Wikipedia. I mean, you know, whatever, that, that would be kind of goofy. But I mean, you know, finding answers from sermons and stuff like that. I don't want you to do that. It's easy to do that, but I don't always spot it, but I usually do. And when students put it through a um, paraphrasing program, I, I can almost always spot it. Um, so don't do that. Just take my notes and, and use my notes and just go. So what you're gonna have to do is go through the notes and you're gonna have to write out your answer first and then write it and then I guess just copy and paste it into the into the Moodle because you really need to write it out first because you're going to be looking at the notes and looking at lectures and remember those seven minute summaries except I didn't do a seven minute summary for Wednesday because it's a sermon I just couldn't do it so but you that's what that's that's what you'll use okay now it's time for questions what questions do you have about this quiz sir Yes. May I speak? Of course. Okay. Uh, how long should we answer? Like, is there any word limit for each question? Because the first question, number one, has three, four points in it. 
and how long do you expect us to write? You're going to be writing longer than you would be writing if we were in class and we had one hour and 15. Oh, no, this is a one hour class. So it would be longer. I would, and so I'm to, for an essay question, for all of you, you're really good students. All of you are in this course. This is a really awesome course for me to be able to teach. Kind of a pain that we're online, but that's all right. Anyway. I would think that you would probably, for a 50 minute exam, you would probably produce about four pages of writing. So I'm thinking between six to eight pages of writing for the whole thing. Now, remember, handwriting takes up more pages than typing does, a lot more pages. I, and especially, I had one student who would be like 10 sentences per page, it was pretty amazing. And he just filled it up with big gigantic letters. And so he would have, he would hand in like eight pages for a 50 minute quiz. And it was a really big guy. And so I don't know if that's why. Anyway, um, so I would say it's gonna be about six to eight handwritten pages and just kind of use your brain to figure out how many, how many words that would be. Ask, ask more questions about that or other questions, that's fine. So all these uh, essays we have to write uh, and submit on 1st May or uh, can yes. we do it later? Or we have to do uh, all the threes at once? All three at once. Yeah, so, so what you're going to do is um, next week you're going to work on this. Okay, and I'm thinking about us not having class next week so that you can work on writing these essays. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is, this is really only going to work if you actually spend time, okay, and, and go through this because this is, this is making you think, but all of you are smart. And so I'm not worried about you being able to do this. I'm not at all worried. But uh, so what I'm thinking is that um, you will use your class time that you would be coming to class on Monday and Wednesday, and you would use that as a part of your studying. And then on Friday, uh, what I'm expecting you to do, if you're smart, and then I'll tell you what I'm expecting you to do, because even though you are smart, you're Pakistanis. But be because you're smart, what you should do is just write on Monday, write the answer to the question one and and Tuesday write the answer to question two and Wednesday write the answer to question three and then go back over your answers to make sure they're all okay and then what you should do is Thursday night or Friday morning or whatever just copy and paste them in the Moodle so you'll be in Moodle for five minutes that's all you'll be in Moodle for is five minutes because you'll just copy and paste them because you've already written the answer. So that's what you should do. Now, because you're Pakistanis, even though you're smart, because you're Pakistanis, you're gonna start studying for this um, Thursday night at 11.30 p.m. Okay. And you'll just work on it, and you'll work on it all night, because you'll discover that no matter what I said, you discover that, oh my, this is way more work than I was expecting. And then it'll be, sir, sir, the power went out. Sir, sir, a flood came through my neighborhood locust ate my house whatever but this time you could do the whole thing earlier in the week and regardless all i want you to do on friday is copy and paste it because i want you to write your answers out not on the internet okay questions Uh, uh, where do to... we find your notes in the discussion or in the summaries? Like, summaries are good. Or do, are you going to? Yeah, summaries are good. Summaries enough. are fine. Um, summaries are good enough. I haven't decided are you if I'm going to PowerPoint. I'm thinking about it. I haven't decided if I'm going to upload powerpoints or not. So pray that I make the right decision. Go ahead, Isaac. Sir, uh, do we have to cover all the points like in question one uh, yes. to be in our essay? 
Yes. Okay. To get an A for question one, you have to hit all four points. Excellent question. And, uh, sir, uh, sir, when would we get the summaries? Uh, let me see. Right here. These are the seven minute summaries you can find for your first quiz. They're all right here. Okay. And if I decide to put the, and I'm not sure about the PowerPoint, these seven minute summaries really are all you need. And I like the idea of the seven minute summaries a little better because then what you're going to do is you're going to take notes off of the seven minute summary. And I think, I think you'll learn more by getting your information from the seven minute summaries than you will if I just have the PowerPoints there. Because my experience has been with, with that kind of stuff is students are really smart. And so they just look for the words that they're looking for in the PowerPoint and they ignore the rest. But if you have to listen to the seven minute summary uh, to get your answer, I think that's gonna be a little bit more. I was thinking about Wednesday of next week during class time that I could just open up and if people want to drop in and ask questions on Wednesday, we could certainly do that. And if no one comes, no one comes, I'll just leave it on for an hour, eat my lunch. And if no one comes, no one comes, that's no problem. But I thought about opening it up on Wednesday and just so that you could just come on and just ask questions and we could talk about it. I tend to give away yeah, answers. It's a good idea. Think so? Okay, I'll do that. But I won't. Well, yeah, I guess I will record that and put that online. Yeah, I would do that. That would be fair. Okay. Other questions? Sir? And, uh, sir the Martina. Okay. So you normally give Ruby Cube for whatever you're going to mark? Because we need to write something and you are expecting us to write something and you mark us accordingly. So are you going to give any Ruby cube for these essays? No offense, but it's a rubric, not a Rubik's cube. Okay. A Ru I, if you want me to give you a Rubik's cube, I can do that, but that's a little different. Okay. So, um, you know, what a Rubik's, that cube that's a rubik's cube okay so if you want me i can do that there you go but instead i could do a rubric that's a good idea let me put that on my to-do list just wait a second that's a very good idea I put that in my to-do list for today. That's an extremely good idea. So I will do that. So I will set together a, a rubric and put that up for you all. And um, sorry for making fun of you. I'm feeling really guilty now. Okay, other questions? All great questions. I have the right people here. Sir, the, uh, I, I have a question about quizzes. Like uh, we have to do it in uh, four, five parts. Like it's first main, uh, first main submission. Uh, second May submission, then fourth May submission, then fifth May submission. I was confused about that. Are you are you looking online, and is that what's confusing you? Why I don't understand about the submission. Okay, so let me show you the let me show you the quiz. All right, here it is. All right, so we. Oh yeah, I figured that would happen. Drives me nuts the way this thing times out so quickly. All right, so all right. So preview the quiz. Quiz one, you're just going to, here it is, and you're just gonna dump it in there. You can do it tomorrow. You can do the whole quiz today and, and dump this all in tomorrow. But I want you to do it offline, write the whole answer, and then copy and paste it into here. I don't want you to write it online first because then power is gonna go out, you're gonna have all the messes, all right? So I just answered the first one, then you get to the next one. Here's the second question, and you've already written the answer, and you just dump it in there. And then third, you've already written the answer, you've been working on it all week, and just dump it in here. This is the easiest one. Well, no, the second one's pretty easy too. Okay, so then you just hand in your exam. 
All right. Now, because God loves you and because you need to learn, there's also a second quiz. The second quiz is super easy. So all of you should get 100 on it, okay? All of you. This quiz is on the 2nd, the 4th, the 5th, and the 6th of May. And this quiz is a identification quiz of events. So what I did was I took 120 events. I took 110 events, events from the Torah, and I took 10 events from the other parts of the Old Testament. And what I did was I just made a big list and went through them all, and then I mixed them all up. And then what I did was I put together a four-part quiz. The first part is due on Saturday. I'll just show you what it looks like so you can see. All right, so here we go. I'm going to do my attempt. No, that's not what I want. Somebody's already done this. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, here it is. Cain kills Abel. Laws about many different things. Is that in Numbers, Leviticus, Genesis? That's the hardest question in the whole one. Death of Moses. Is that in Deuteronomy? Is it in others? And so all it is is just this. So what you're going to do is you're going to need to be able to look, do a Google search to find out where that event happened if you don't know which book it's in. If it's like Adam and Eve sin, what's well, in Genesis? If it's Moses dies, that's in the last book, that's Deuteronomy. But otherwise, what you're going to need to do is you're just going to have to search for the answers. Okay, the purpose of it is one of our course goals is that you will know the general contents of the five books of the Torah. And so this is how I'm doing it. So this, the only thing I'm worried about this quiz is Bidgley. I am worried that you're going to have problems with the power going out. By the way, if the power goes out and you're knocked out, this is for sure, okay? When the power comes back on, okay, the way that you, the way that you're able to get back in and not lose what you've already written is to, to go back. You just go back, like I'm up here and back and back and back and back. And what the first time you go back, it'll make you sign in. Then after you sign in, then you just keep going back until you come back to the quiz where you were. And it'll have all of your answers there. I mean, I've done that because the same thing happens when I mark quizzes. Oh, it's a royal pain. So I'll be marking 35, well, 32 quizzes or 33 quizzes, and I'll be in quiz 25. And um, I lose, you know, you know how sometimes it just shuts down with, with uh, error number 500, and it says that there's a server problem. So I'll lose it. I'll lose everything. And then I have to wait sometimes for 10, 15 minutes. But then if I go back and back, first I have to sign in. And then after I sign in, I go back, I get all of my answers, just so that you know. If you didn't understand what I said, so questions? Sir? Questions? I have done this, uh, this quiz. Yeah. And there are a couple of questions I couldn't understand because the statement which you have written over there are both uh, uh, in the both books. Like if it is pre present in the Exodus, it also in Leviticus. So what we should, because I choose the one which, which is in the, uh, like here is a question 25, uh, laws about the sacrifices. So I choose numbers, but it is saying it is not correct answer. The correct answer is Leviticus. So. Okay, a little clue for all of you. If it says laws about, if it says laws about, about, the laws about are in Leviticus. Laws about are in Leviticus. So I'll look at that. I will look more than that. happily look at that. So what you should all do. So what you should all do. Right, we're getting feedback. That's right, weird. We're getting feedback. What you should all do is if you if there's any question that you think is unfair, you just 
take a screenshot of it and send it to me, and then I'll just make it okay. So rather, I'm not going to change the quiz at this point. But I will give grace to anybody in, in that situation, unless it's obvious. Other questions? Now you notice that this, this awful quiz is later. Okay, so this quiz is, um, yeah, so this, this quiz is on May 2nd for the first one, and they're short. It's, it's 25 to 30 questions per, per part. There are four parts, and I tried to keep them short. And so you'll just see here are the quizzes here, okay? Now, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because one of our course goals is that you'll have a familiarity with the events and the parts of the five books of the Torah. And so this is how I did it. I've never been able to figure out how to do it right. Maybe I'll never do this again, we'll see. Or maybe I'll do it every year, we'll see. Any questions? Is anybody like thinking about dropping the course now? It's too late. Yeah, it's too late, sorry. Withdraw, with, withdrawing from the course was over like a couple of days ago, sorry. Okay, so you're ready, right? This will be great. Everybody's gonna get A's and life is gonna be easy and all of that stuff, okay? And don't be scared about it. just do it. Just do it, but don't, don't do it wrong. All right, okay. Um, okay, now I have a lecture. I was just going to do the Bible Project. I was just going to have you guys watch the Bible Project and not do a lecture. But I don't think that was the right thing. So this is the Book of Numbers. Hello, Shurun. Hello. Are you OK? Yes, sir. Did you hear all the stuff about the quizzes, or were you were you off then? Did you hear everything I said about the quizzes? Shurun, did you hear what I said about the quizzes? Sir, I came like 10 minutes late, but I heard all about the quizzes, sir. And you're still smiling. If I will... Nobody else yes, is smiling. Sir. You're the only one who's smiling. Sir, uh, I'm just happy. Good. Well, I'm happy to. All right. Okay, stories and numbers. Book of Numbers has three different subjects. Broadly speaking, Book of Numbers is an astonishing book. And you need to realize that it's not as bad as you always think it is. It's only bad in the first four chapters. After the first four chapters, I mean, there are a couple of chapters. Yes, there are a couple of chapters that are like laws about sacrifice and there's laws about leprosy, et cetera. But awesome book, awesome book. Okay, so numbers one through four is a census. I'm talking about just like in Pakistan, God tells Moses at the beginning, um, like a year after they've, they've gotten out of um, the promised land, he says, I want you to do a census of every tribe, of all the people. I want to know how many, well, God knows, but he wanted Mo Moses to know. He wanted Moses to know how many people, how many soldiers, I mean, how many men could be soldiers, and all of that. So they do a census of all of the Hebrew tribes. And these four chapters also tell where the tribes are supposed to camp. So the tribe of Levi is the closest one to the tent of meeting, and then they sort of go from there. So it's very specific instructions about where people go. Numbers chapters five and six, is laws, pretty interesting laws, really. Number seven through nine, let's pop over here, is setting up the tent of meeting. And that's kind of interesting because it's 
where do they get donations for the building of the tenant meeting? And um, pretty interesting. And there are also other laws. Now, most of you would stop reading the book of Numbers before you got to chapter nine. And the reason is because it's just numbers. And even chapter seven through nine, a lot of it is like, well, this person gave this amount of silver, this tribe gave this amount of silver, this family gave this amount of silver. So a lot of it is like that. So a lot of it doesn't feel real interesting. Okay. Numbers 10 through 36 are stories about what happened in the journey, along the journey in the wilderness. So that's where we're going. We're not gonna look at the laws, we're gonna look at the stories and one in particular. Okay, so here's a, here's, I'm gonna make you guys little for a second. Here's the first part. People complain about the journey and God brings fire. That's just three verses. And the fire there could be lightning or it could be fire. Um, it's on the outer part of the camp. Other uh, people complain about the limited kinds of food, like manna, that's it, but and so God brings quail. And quail's kind of bird. I don't know if they have quail here. Um, you guys had quail in Pakistan? Do you know? Have you heard of quail before? Yeah, I don't know. And then the next story, oh, and by the way, a lot of people die in that story because they complain about the food, they're tired of manna, and they want to have meat. And I never understood that this until I was studying for this lecture. I didn't know, I didn't understand that even though they were slaves, they were not suffering as much when they weren't working because they had food. The reason they had food is because it was like parts of the Punjab that have just really great land for growing food. And so, the land of Goshen, where the Hebrews were in Egypt, was where most of the wheat, vegetables, um, good stuff came from. It came from the land of Goshen, where the Hebrews lived. So they actually were able to eat food. They were also able to eat meat. And the reason they were able to eat meat is they were still shepherds. So even though they were slaves, boy, I've just lost people. There's like a massive dropout there. Um, even though they were slaves, they um, still were able to eat meat because of the fact that they were farmers and they were shepherds. And so they had meat from the, from the sheep and they had vegetables from their farms. So that's interesting. But now in the wilderness, all they get is manna. We don't know what manna was, but that's all they get. It's, it's very depressing for them. Um, you, could, you could make the manna into something like bread, sort of like chapatis, and it had a nice flavor to it. It had a sweet flavor to it, which is kind of cool. But that's all you get every single day. What's for breakfast? Manna. What's for lunch? Manna. What's for dinner? Manna. So that does get tiring after a while. Um, and God judged them for that by bringing them quail. And then they all got sick. He brought them a lot of quail, these birds. Um, Aaron... Aaron, and by the way, the thing with the quail, which even today, even today, there are times when enormous flocks of quail come into that area of the world, like millions of them. And so this actually was not that unusual that this happened. All right. Second, uh, or third, Aaron and Miriam are very angry at Moses. And it's really Miriam. I think Aaron just... He always does whatever anybody tells him to do, but it's really Miriam. Miriam is jealous of the fact that Moses gets all of the leadership. And Moses is like the totally not proud person. He has no interest in being leader. He doesn't want any of this. It just happens that God has chosen him. But Aaron and especially Miriam are very bitter about it. And they say, you know, what's the deal with you? How come you're doing this? And they're both confronting Moses. And all of a sudden, the glory of God appears at the tent of meeting. And Moses and Aaron, and, and God calls Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And he says, come to this tent of meeting now. And so they come to the tent of meeting. 
and God says, I chose Moses. Moses is my appointed servant. He's the one I'm going to speak through. And he makes, he gives Miriam leprosy. So the whole group of the Hebrews, for a whole week, seven days, they all stop, they set up camp, and they have to wait for Miriam, who is sent outside of the camp to live on the outside in a tent, and because she's now has leprosy for seven days. Then we have the 12 spies, which we already talked about, and then we have, um, and the people rebel against Moses, we already talked about that. And we have a really interesting one, very similar to the Aaron and Miriam one, really interesting one. Korah demands to be on equal status as the sons of Aaron. This is really interesting. I, this is really interesting. God has chosen Aaron and his sons to be the priests, but Korah is demanding that he and others also should be allowed to be priests. And Korah is jealous of the fact that Aaron and his sons and a very small number of people are allowed to go into the temple and are allowed to offer sacrifices and are allowed to bring incense into the tent, uh, into the holy place every day, twice a day. And so, so Korah says, no, we are all equal before God. Therefore, all of us should be able to go into the tent of meeting. All of us should be able to go. So Moses is like, look, I, I didn't ask for this job. I mean, that's basically what he says. He says, I didn't ask for this job, and I'm not doing this for me. God's the one who chose me. So you need to deal with God here. So Moses said, tomorrow God will choose between me and Korah and all the people who are with Korah. And so Moses said, but I tell all of you Hebrews that if you are wise, you're going to get away from Korah and his family because God may just swallow them up into the earth. That's exactly what happens. The earth opens up. Korah and his family go down into that, and they're gone forever. They die. And then the people get really angry, and they blame Moses for Korah's death. So then God ends up bringing a judgment on them. And they stop the judgment using incense. God sends, uh, Moses sends Aaron out among the people because the people are all dying. And Moses sends Aaron out to stop the plague and the people stop dying. So most of the incidents that happen in these chapters are incidents where people are rebelling against Moses. Really discouraging and depressing if you're Moses. Not nice chapters at all. So those are those stories. And honestly, all of us, when you read those stories, and you really should, they're really easy stories to read. And when you read those stories for your own growth and edification, building up, you, you're like, wow. Paul said that these things happen to them as examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So you really need to read these stories in Numbers because Paul talks about these very stories in 1 Corinthians 10 about how we need to learn from that what happened to them. So any questions about these stories before we get to our main point today? Who was Korah? And it's... Yeah, Korah is just a guy. He's just a, he's, he's just a Hebrew like anybody else. Let's take a look see. Rubric, Rubik Cube, I don't think we need that. Um, Oh, there's a picture of him. He's just a guy. Uh, yeah, that's true. So the core, his his descendants, awesomely. Uh, he's just a guy who was in rebellion. There's nothing special about him at all. So my my sense is that Cora was probably a really persuasive person. So I went to Got Questions. I like this, this website, by the way. Um, and nothing special about him at all. He was, in, he was a Levite, and he had response, he, his, his family had responsibility for carrying um, 
family had the responsibility for carrying the, the, the parts of the tenant meeting. So he's a Levite, and he felt that they should have the right to be able to go into the temple and offer sacrifices because they were sons of Levi. So there you go. He's just a guy. Any other questions? All right, now we get to our real point. Sir, who is Aaron and Miriam? Moses' sister is Miriam. She's his older sister, and Aaron, or Arun, is Moses' older brother. And so they, and Miriam had prophesied, and of course, Arun was really important. He was like the high priest. He was literally the high priest. But Miriam had prophesied, and that was her argument. She said, why is God only speaking through you, Moses? God spoke through me, and that was when they crossed the Red Sea, God had spoken through Miriam, and the Bible calls her a prophetess. So she is a prophetess. But she said, God spoke through me, and so why are you the one who's getting all of the glory? And so pretty interesting. And, and I won't say any more about that unless you have questions. 39 years passed after these events. Nothing to see there. Hebrews were now getting ready to invade the, prom, the, the land of Canaan. Now, it's really important to realize that the last part of the book of Numbers is 39 years after the first part. In other words, we get through Korah and his rebellion, and then we have Aaron's his staff, they do something so that God shows that Aaron is the true priest. And then another 39 years pass. And so the last chapters of Numbers are right before the Hebrews invade the promised land. Right before the Hebrews invade the promised land, that's where the last chapters of, of the book of Numbers and so remember that everybody who was 20 years, this was Wednesday's message, everyone who was 20 years or older when the Hebrews refused, remember, when they refused to invade Canaan, those who were 20 years or older died in the wilderness. So most of the people by, by this point, by this point is right before they invade the promised land. Most of those people had died who were 20 years old or older. So all of you would be dead. The, the people we read about now are almost all 59 years old or younger. Yeah, because it's, it's been 40 years. So they're 59 years old or younger. They were 19 years old and one person was 19 years old and 364 days. And he didn't die in the wilderness. But his twin was 20 years old because he was born five minutes earlier. And so he was actually 20 years old and he died in the wilderness. If that didn't make sense to you, it was a joke. It's so hard to do jokes on the internet. It's just so hard. So the people we read about now are almost all 59 years old or younger. Many of them were born on the journey and had never been slaves in Egypt. And that's, you got to keep that in mind. The people we're reading about now in the last part of Numbers, had never been slaves. At this point in the story, Moses commits a terrible sin with terrible consequences. So what we're going to do is in the next seven minutes, we're going to answer the question, what happened? First, Moses' sister Miriam died. So she died. The entire Israelite community entered the wilderness of Zin in the first month. That means the first month of the 40th year since they'd escaped from Egypt. That's what that means. It's the first month of the 40th year since they'd escaped from Egypt. And so they settled in Kaddish. Miriam died and was buried there. She was one of the last people of the older generation to die, and I do wonder why. Did she agree with the people 39 years before who refused to conquer the land? That's my guess. So there's no water for the community, all right? So they all assembled against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, if we had, if only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord, why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us 
and our livestock to die here. Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain, figs, with vines, and pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Now, let me, at first we're like, who are these people? These are the people who were not, most of these people were not slaves in Egypt. All of these people have been free way longer than they have been slaves. So the people were 19 years old before. Yes, they have been slaves for 19 years, but they've been free for 40 years. And most of the people had never experienced not having water, which is terrifying. Imagine going without water for a day. Oh. When you guys fast for Lent, do you guys do, do without water all day? Do you guys drink water during the day or you no water? Is it do you drink water during Lent or no water? You know, no no offense, but if you do this and you do this, you can. Can you repeat the question, sir? During Lent, do Christians drink water all day long? No. Oh, that's no. Bad. I do. You should. I don't know about the rest. We do if we don't fast. Like if you're not fasting, we can drink water. <laughs> I figured that out. Yeah, because when you, you don't drink never... water, that's like the worst thing in the world. That's nuts. Do Muslims drink water during the day? No. No, no they don't. Wow. It's bad enough during the winter, but during the summer, that's terrifying. Okay. Yes. There you go. So then you all who have done this, you understand what's going on. Um, excuse me for a second. Kind of inspired me to drink some water. All right. So there's no water to drink. Of course, the people are angry. The people are angry because most of them have never experienced being without water because they didn't experience the deliverance. They didn't experience those first days in the wilderness when they didn't have water. So this is new for them. So they're upset. God's response, speak to the rock and bring water for them. I want to say that this is an awesome special effect here. I just want to say I did that. Um, I didn't draw it, but I did. All right, so the Lord spoke to Moses. Take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield its water. You will bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. And I want you to notice here, God's not angry with people. The people are upset. They're panicking because they don't have water. And I would be upset too. But even though this is happening, I'd love to know who that is. Even though this is happening, God's not angry at them at all. God does not say any angry words at all about the people. And I want you to keep that in mind because this is of this awful story. Okay. To speak to the rock, like, what, do, what did they speak? Yeah, we really good question. Really, really good question. What did he speak? I don't know. What would he have spoken? So we're going we're gonna to answer that question in a minute, but not quite yet. It's a good question that I don't have a good answer to. Um, Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? You can already feel that this is not right. Listen, you rebels, must we bring water <coughs> out of the rock for you? Automatically, you know, ooh, that doesn't sound right at all. Because God wasn't angry. This is a good picture of Moses, though. I love that. I wish I knew who drew this. That's an awesome picture of Moses. All right. Moses then disobeyed God's command. God had said, take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Arun, Arun are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will yield its water. You are to bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of the rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. You can hear the sound effects in the background, so that a great amount of water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. 
I don't know where this noise is coming from. I don't see anybody whose mics are on except mine. I don't know, God knows. All right, so now we see what Moses has done. He has been angry. He struck the rock. He was supposed to speak to it. All right, next. We'll come back to the speaking question. Here comes the water. Isn't that an awesome picture? He's mad, but it's pretty awesome looking. All right. I wish I could draw. That's okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. And this is so interesting. Because you did not trust me enough to show me as holy before the Israelites, Therefore, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. I spent a lot of time this morning in the Hebrew trying to figure this one out. Because you did not trust me enough to show me as holy before the Israelites. Therefore, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Wow. What was Moses' sin here? Moses' faith broke down. Notice, you did not trust me enough. It's in the Hebrew, it's definitely a faith question. Definitely faith. What faith? Faith in what? He was not trusting God to show him as holy. So Moses was angry, but God was not. I'm going to explain this again. So by using God as an excuse to rebuke the people, he was not treating God as holy. I know this is really hard to understand. This is a crazy question. Why? Why, what was Moses not believing? Moses was not believing that God was holy. I mean, that's what it says. Let's look at it again to make sure you see. Because you did not trust me enough to show me as holy. So it's a trust issue, and it's the word faith there. It's the word faith in the, in the Hebrew. So you did not trust me, and it says, you did not trust in me. That's what it literally says, is you did not trust in me to show me as holy. And it says that, to show me as holy before, and it says before the Israelites, therefore you will not bring this community into the land. So he's not trusting God. He's not showing that God is holy. What is he not trusting God about? I think he's not trusting God that God wanted to give them the water because Moses didn't want to give them the water. God never called them rebels. Moses called them rebels. God was not angry at all. He wasn't even a little angry. Yes, Sharun. Sir, I think he got frustrated yeah. because of all this time they were waiting and he was facing all sort of oppression from people that they were you know, telling him off and stuff. So I think he got frustrated and pissed off. I think he got frustrated too. And I'm not going to disagree with you, but I'm going to give you a slightly different answer that's a part of what you said. Verse 1 of this story is where his sister dies. Verse two is when the people complain about the water. And when Moses wrote the book of Numbers, I think Moses purposely wanted us to see that those two stories belong together. Verse one, Moses' sister dies. Verse two, the people complain. So I'm going to give you my suggestion. I think that Moses is blaming the people that his sister didn't make it into the promised land. Because if the people had been willing to invade the promised land 39 years before, Moses and Miriam and Arun would have been able to cross the border into the promised land and to enjoy the blessings of the promised land. But because of the people for the last 40 years, they weren't able to do that. Now, I might be wrong, but it seems to me that the thing that he's angry about, that he's fed up about, is his sister just died. And she should have been able to go into the promised land. And she wasn't able to go into the promised land. And I think he was bitter about that. And he blamed the people for it. He saw them as the reason it happened. Does that make sense? Might be wrong. I'm not the only person who believes that. Lots of people believe that. But I don't know. When but, I first sir, read this. Yes, Isaac. But because of that frustration, he also couldn't make it. Yes. Yes. So, oh my word. Look at this. Therefore, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Now, this is not an issue of obedience. This is an issue of faith. 
He did not say because you did not obey me enough. That's not what he says here. He says because you did not trust me enough. And sometimes when we get bitter, we stop trusting God. And I want to say, if any among you are pastors by any chance, Masood, be very careful when you talk to God's people of acting as if when you're angry at people, that God also is angry at people. Or when you're disappointed with people, God also is disappointed with people. Or if you are disgusted with people, that God also is. That's not treating God as holy. In other words, God is God. He is what he is. He does what he does. I can't say, because I'm mad at you, therefore God is also mad at you. And leaders, Christian leaders, can do this. Preachers can preach messages, and pastors can tell their churches, you people should be giving more money, you're not giving money, and you people should be doing this, and you people should stop doing that. And they can be very angry when they preach. It's very common. But... That's not treating God as holy. God can do his own anger. He doesn't need you to do it for him. And that's what goes on with poor Moses. So Moses wasn't trusting God as holy. He called the people rebels when God had not done that. Moses said, can we, must we bring water out of this rock for you? This was God's decision in Aaron, and God's miracle, not Moses' and Aaron's. Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with a staff. Water came out abundantly, so the community drank and their beasts drank too, but he wasn't supposed to do that. He was supposed to speak. Notice Moses was supposed to speak before their eyes. Let me, get, let me get their eyes over here. It says, oh, I'll just put you down there. It says, speak to the rock before their eyes. That's in the Hebrew. It's in the Hebrew. God wanted Moses to speak in the hearing of the people. He wanted them to speak before them because he wanted the people to see what was going on. That's really interesting. There's something that God wanted the people to see. Moses took that away from them. The speaking, I can, this is answering Isaac's question. The only speaking I can imagine is that Moses would be asking for water. That's what God wanted. Instead, when he hits it, this is like what magicians do. This is like what Pharaoh's magicians did. This is not what God does. Speaking is asking. Hitting is anger. And so here, this is not right. Every other event that happens after this is preparing the Hebrews. For, oh, okay, before I do that. Any questions about this before we finish this up? Sir, but uh, Moses also hit the Red Sea with his staff. Yes, God told him to. You're right. So I agree with you. I agree. He never hit anything twice, but I do agree that that was fine. If God told him to do that, that was fine. Here, God, oh, by the way, why would God do that? Why wouldn't God want Moses to hit? Because I think what God wants, Mo what the people, I think the people want, I, got, I think God wants the people to start trusting in God. Not long, no longer in Moses. They're going to be living in this whole promised land. They're about to cross the border. They're about to cross the Jordan River. They're about to invade the promised land. It's just going to be a couple months from this. And so it's time for the people to stop depending on Moses. And if Moses is the one who hits the rock, then they're going to feel like they need miraculous power. But if Moses speaks to the rock and says, please give me water, God then that's a different situation that the people can apply in their lives. And so I think this is, it's not that it's sin to hit the rock, but I think it is sin for Moses not to do what God wanted him to do because God didn't want the people to continue to follow Moses once they entered the promised land because they're going to have to live the relationship with God personally. Maybe. That's my guess. Yes. It's a really, oh, by the way, Moses did make it into the promised land. When Jesus but he was, just saw the, oh, no. Yeah, he did see. You're right. No, you're right. God took him up on a high mountain. He saw the whole promised land. I think God miraculously showed him more than we would ever see. But then when Jesus came um, and he was on, when he was transformed before everybody, not everybody, but before Peter, James, and John on top of the mountain, Moses was there. 
And I bet the first thing Moses said to Jesus was, thank you, Lord, for letting me finally in. And so Moses will be there. And then uh, lots of very good scholars think that Moses will also be in Jerusalem at the end. That the two witnesses, lots of good scholars believe that one of those two witnesses is Moses. That's my personal opinion. We'll find out. Okay. No class on Monday. Write your quiz. I told you how to do it. Okay. So do the quizzes. Wednesday will be a... Yeah, let's do, let's do the question class, class on Wednesday. Wednesday, we will have a question class. And if you're not interested, if you're really super smart, if you know so much you don't need any help, um, if you're Moses, or if you talk to Moses and he gives you the answers, then you don't need to come on Wednesday. And But if you do want to get answers, I'll record it. I won't do a seven-minute summary of Wednesday. I will do a seven-minute summary of today. Um, but not of Wednesday, and I will, um, but I will record it, and I will post Wednesday's class online for those of you who have visually or whatever problems. Any questions? Nope. Sure. Sir, so this is this sin that he didn't do as God wanted him to do. This was his only sin. His only sin was not trusting God. <clears throat> that was his only sin. And so that really sin, you got to get this in your mind. That's what it says. It says, you did not trust me to show my holiness to the people. That's what God said. You did not trust in me to show my holiness to the people. So his sin was not trusting in God. And his sin was... God letting God, and this is so hard to understand, his sin was not letting God be God. And God wanted to give them the water. God didn't see them as rebels. God wasn't angry at them. God wanted to show them that he would give them what they needed. And Moses didn't do that. Instead of that, he's angry. He calls them rebels. He strikes the rock twice. He's doing the exact opposite of what God wants. And so God's like, Moses, I wanted you to do this so the people would realize that I am the source of everything they need. But Moses, you were angry, and by doing that, you didn't treat me as holy. And because you didn't treat me as holy, this is what happened. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank this you, sir. Lecture, yeah, this lecture is not on the quiz. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay, sir. Are we done? Yes, sir. Everybody's happy? Yes. Then I'm happy. Then I'm going to go make some pretzels. If you don't know what pretzels are, you're really missing out in life. Okay. I'm going to say God bless you all and goodbye. <laughs>